spend six months tying together a One Piece theory that tells us pretty much everything about God Valley that you could uncover. At the end of the video, you'll have learned the true name of God Valley, which was foreshadowed since Skypea, why Rox went to God Valley, Shanks and Eno's connection to God Valley, the truth behind Law's Devil Fruit and its God Valley connection, Blackbeard's endgame dream and fate, the secrets behind the Moon City, the secrets behind the Lunarians, the truth of Jaya, the truth of immortality and will, and lastly, the name of the ancient kingdom. So now that I know that you're gonna watch this entire thing, let me just say that I combined 5 videos into one and that you can watch each one separately on the channel. In this video, I took out stuff from each of the 5 that wasn't connected to the theory, so this theory is the best version of all of them, but I will leave the links to the other videos in the description if you still want to watch them individually. Now with all that being said, let's get straight into the ultimate God Valley theory. To start this theory off, let me explain why I believe he's a half-former celestial dragon. So the first piece of evidence that proves this goes all the way back to the first chapter of One Piece. The way this chapter tells us this is because this backstory of Shanks and Luffy shows us that Shanks and a celestial dragon, Corazon, are direct parallels with each other. If you look closely, you'll realize that Shanks and Luffy's backstory is almost the exact same thing as Corazon and Law's. Shanks is the Corazon to Luffy, a kid Luffy looks up to Shanks. A kid Law looks up to Corazon. Shanks steals one of the most important devil fruits in the entire story from the world government and then doesn't give it to Luffy but he still ends up eating it. Corazon stole one of the most important devil fruits in the story that's apparently even worth up to 5 to 10 billion berries from the world government and gave it a Law. In Luffy's backstory, Shanks ended up saving him by sacrificing his body. In Law's backstory, Corazon ended up saving Law by sacrificing his body. Because of the backstory, Luffy ended ended up being inspired to be just like Shanks, a pirate who fights for his friends. Because of Law's backstory, he ended up being inspired by Corazon, a guy that seems to be a pirate that also has connections to certain marines. Luffy ended up wearing the straw hat, which is something that represents Shanks and the next time he'll see him. Law ended up wearing a jacket that says Corazon on it, which obviously represents Corazon. Another thing is that Law got a heart tattoo which may also represent Corazon, since Corazon means heart in Spanish. Lastly, Luffy's pirate crew name ended up being called the Straw Hats, which is an emblem that he got from Shanks. Law's crew name ended up being called the Heart Pirates, which could either represent Corazon since it's the English translation for heart, or it could represent the emblem that Corazon gave him, which is the devil fruit shaped like a heart. So with all these parallels, the last one may end up being that Shanks is a good former celestial dragon who helps someone with the will of D, just like how Corazon is a good former celestial dragon who helps someone with the will of D. More proof of these two being connected is that Law and Luffy are currently allies, which could show that Corazon and Shanks have some ties together. Even with all these parallels between the two, somehow there's even more, which has to do with their close ones. Shanks has someone that was like a brother to him, who's represented as a clown. Corazon has a blood-related brother that depicts a clown, since Doflamingo's nickname is Joker. The guy that Shanks used to consider a brother is a clown that became a warlord and was running the black market. Corazon's brother is a clown that became a warlord and that also ran the black market. Both sets of brothers also ended up not getting along in the end and going their separate ways. Buggy hates Shanks because he believes he made him eat the devil fruit, while Doflamingo hates Corazon for betraying him. Another parallel with Shanks and Corazon could be that they are both on pirate crews with Jolly Rogers that have their left eye crossed out. Now, with all these pieces of evidence, I wouldn't be surprised if Oda is waiting for a huge reveal for Shanks, which is that he's a celestial dragon. In Dress Rosa, we learned about Dolphy being a celestial dragon and Law being a Will of D member which was hundreds of chapters after they were introduced. If Oda can wait a hundred chapters for less important characters like Doflamingo, then I definitely think he's got some insane reveals with Shanks after a thousand chapters. Now the next reason I believe Shanks is a celestial dragon is because of Blackbeard. Blackbeard is known to be Shanks' biggest enemy in One Piece. In fact, not only his biggest enemy, but possibly his only enemy. We've never seen Shanks have any real enemy as it seems he can talk head to head with damn near everyone and not cause too much conflict. Sure, Shanks may have had a single clash in disagreement with Whitebeard, or he may have been considered Mihawk's biggest rival, but it doesn't really seem like he was ever enemies with any of these guys. Even the Gorsei allows him to walk straight into the room while the reverie is taking place to discuss a certain pirate. I also believe this may show us that Shanks has former Celestial Dragon blood in him because he's somehow allowed to schedule meetings with the highest known power in the world. I don't think they'd meet up with anyone else other than Admiral 
emeralds or another celestial dragon, especially in the time of the reverie and the time of their meeting with Im sama Also, in this meeting, many believe Shanks was talking about Blackbeard when he said, we need to discuss a certain pirate, which definitely could have been the case since he always seems to be worried about what Blackbeard is doing. Now, going back to how Shanks' only enemy is Blackbeard, what if the two of them are fated to clash as one is a Will of D member while the other is a celestial dragon? Not only this, but Blackbeard isn't only a member of that clan, but he's also an evil one with the D initial. Shanks, on the other hand, may be part celestial dragon, but he's a good one and not evil like the rest of them. This is kind of interesting considering that usually those with the D are on the right side of the story and the celestial dragons are on the wrong side. I wonder how Oda will make this play out. I'll discuss more on why I don't think Shanks is evil or a villain later on in the video, but that's after all the rock stuff too. The next reason I think Shanks could be part god is because he's based off of an actual god. Shanks seems to be based off of the god of war in Norse mythology. This god was remembered as Tyr. This Norse god Tyr offered his arm to a wolf in order to balance the realms. This kind of sounds like what Shanks did, which was to offer his arm to bet on the new generation. Another direct influence from Tyr would be that Tyr used his wisdom and power to stop wars instead of start them. Just like how Shanks stopped one of the biggest wars at Marineford with his power and wisdom. We even see an interesting quote from Sengoku when Shanks pulls up, which is, only because it's you red haired. I remember the first time I saw this, I thought to myself, that has to be foreshadowing something down the line because it's just such a strange thing to say to a pirate. Only because it's Shanks? Why only Shanks? Well maybe because he's a former celestial dragon and Sengoku wouldn't want to upset the Gorosei. The God of War title has a ring to it that makes it seem violent, but it's actually the complete opposite. The God of War in One Piece has the ability to stop wars and it seems like he's always trying to do so even when he meets with Whitebeard. Okay, so now that with everything I've now explained, that's pretty much why I believe Shanks is a former celestial dragon, but now let me tell you why I also think he has the will of D. The first reason I believe he has the will of D yet again takes us all the way back to chapter 1. In chapter 1, we see that Shanks wore the straw hat, which we now know he received from Goldie Roger. Now, this hat isn't just some random thing to have her wear. It's a hat that is specifically inherited by the D-Clan and an important symbol from the Void Century. I just don't see Roger giving this hat to some average Joe. He'd most likely only give it to someone that was destined to wear it, just like how he was and just like how Luffy is. If the Joy Boy from the Void Century also wore the straw hat, which is what most people believe since there's a giant one in a freezer in Pangaea Castle, then I think that's even more evidence that Shanks wearing the hat may show us that he's a D member since he's inheriting the will of the man who started it all. Another thing from chapter 1 that proves this is that Shanks says that Luffy reminds him a lot of how he was when he was a kid. So basically he's saying that Luffy and himself are somewhat the same. Kind of like how Luffy and Roger are also the same. Maybe that's why he gave Luffy the straw hat because he knows Luffy can carry his and Roger's will. Maybe that's also why Roger gave Shanks the straw hat because Shanks reminded himself of when he was a kid so he knew Shanks would inherit the will of the straw hat. Just like how it was Shanks' favorite hat, Luffy's favorite hat, probably at some point also Roger's favorite hat, it was most likely also Joy Boy's favorite hat. We even know Luffy is the same as Shanks since we see him fight for his friends and even doing the exact same thing as Shanks in a bar fight. Just like how they both didn't fight in the bar, they ended up fighting the same villains that messed with them after they messed with their friends, Luffy and Cricket. Another parallel would be that Luffy and Blackbeard have been direct enemies since the first time they met, just like how he's Shanks' biggest enemy. This is just like how Rox, who seems to be inherited by Blackbeard, was Roger's number one enemy. Basically, with all these parallels, we can assume that just like Roger and Luffy, Shanks also has the middle initial of D. The only main difference between the three of them would be that Luffy is a lot goofier and more silly since he ate the model Nika fruit, but that's only because the fruit made him become that way. Without that, he'd actually act exactly like Roger and Shanks do. I truly think all three of them were fated to meet by the will of D. Another reason I think Shanks may have the will of D is because of the movie Red. Now I know it hasn't come out yet or anything and it most likely won't be canon but do you guys really find it a coincidence that the logo for Red has Shanks' scar right over the D? I mean what if Oda told them to make the logo that way? We do already know he's somewhat involved in the movie so who knows maybe we'll get something on the will of D in the movie 
Luffy. Although I think it'd be a whole lot better if we learned Shanks' whole name and purpose in the manga. So now with these two things being said, now you know why I think Shanks has the will of D. But now let me tell you what I believe his full name is. I believe there could be two reasons the world government didn't show us his name. One, because he has the D initial and the last name of a celestial dragon. They may want to hide the fact that such a thing could even exist. The other, more logical reason would be because he has the last name of a man who was erased from history, Rox D. Sebek. Why else would the world government have to hide Shanks' last name unless it was a name that they wanted erased from history? Even with this logical explanation to not knowing his last name yet, there is still actual evidence from the manga that may prove to us Shanks' lineage. In chapter 434, when Shanks and Whitebeard meet, Whitebeard tells him that when he looks at his face, the scars he got from him start to ache. Who would be him? Who does Shanks' face remind Whitebeard of? Who does he look like? I don't think his face alone reminds him of Roger, because even though Shanks was a member of his crew, his face doesn't look anything like him. Also, when Whitebeard meets Buggy, he doesn't say that he reminds him of him, showing that it's not Roger that he was talking about. So, if it's not Roger, then who else could have legit legitimately given Whitebeard scars and look like Shanks at the same time. Well, what if Rox was the one that gave him the scars and also the one that looks like Shanks? I mean, Rox definitely seemed to be the one guy that could actually defeat Whitebeard in a fight or at least scar him. Plus, the Rox pirates were known for not getting along at all, so I wouldn't be surprised if Whitebeard fought the captain. We also know that Shanks' face didn't remind Whitebeard of Blackbeard because he didn't even know that the scar on Shanks' face was from Blackbeard until later in the chapter when Shanks told him. Another thing with Rox possibly being the father of Shanks has to do with the God Valley incident. First of all, how did Rox even learn about its existence, where it was, and how it would make him the king of the world? Like, how do you even discover so much about a place without being a celestial dragon or high class marine? What if Rox met and married a former celestial dragon, which told him all the secrets from God Valley to Imsama? Wouldn't that explain how he learned so much about the world government and even realized that he could become the king of the world. Wouldn't you have to know that there is a king of the world to want to know how to become one? This could all explain why Rox was so crazy and was attempting tasks even harder than that of Roger. It could also explain why the government erased his whole name from history. Like think about it, he didn't achieve his task of becoming the king of the world and he seemed to have lost the war at God Valley and even then they still erased it from history. Like they didn't even do that to Roger, the man who literally found the One Piece and learned all the secrets of the world. Now that should show you something. By the way, all this part on Rocks and God Valley plays a major part to my huge mega 5 part God Valley theory which I will be getting to in upcoming videos. Whatever happened there must have been more insane than what Roger found at Laugh Tale because the whole incident was lost in time. Now tying it all back to Shanks, so if Rox and his wife were at God Valley, what if they also took Shanks there and as they lost the battle, the Roger pirates saved the baby Shanks from being killed by the world nobles. Roger himself is a good guy at heart and would save an innocent baby even if it had the blood of his worst enemies, celestial dragons and rocks. Now you may ask, why do I believe this? Like the chances of this are so unlikely and it seems to only be speculation. Well, the reason I think this could happen is because in chapter 551, Roger tells Garp how the world government will try to kill Ace just because of what he did. He tells him how no child bears sin and asks Garp to take care of Ace. Maybe this belief of Roger, which is that all babies or children are innocent, will be shown to us again later in the story when he takes a baby Shanks from God Valley and raises him. Even though rocks and celestial dragons are his biggest enemies, he still believes the children of them are innocent, just like how even though he's a highness pirate and criminal, that doesn't mean his newborn son is. Also, maybe just like how Roger raised a baby that wasn't his but had the will of D, maybe the same thing happened to his son. The D clan are a clan bonded by fate, so Shanks having the will of D could tie in with that. I believe all of this could definitely be a form of foreshadowing to how Shanks even ended up as a Roger pirate. Plus, Oda seems to hint at Shanks being a crew member since he was a baby, since in Odin's flashback we see Roger say that he hasn't spent time with a baby in ages while holding Toki. After this, Ray Lee says that it reminds him of the old days. This shows that at some point in time, there was a baby on the crew of the Roger pirates. In this same flashback, we also see Blackbeard ask about Buggy and Shanks Shanks, and Marco tells him that they've been around for ages. This proves that Shanks was a Roger pirate for a long time, probably ever since he was
was a baby, he was most likely the baby that Ray Lee was referring to. So now that you understand why I believe Shanks may be the son of Rox, and even looks like him, now what if this is also the reason why Oda still hasn't shown us how Shanks stopped Kaido from going to Marineford? What if in this meetup, Kaido says something about how he looks just like his former captain? I think that would be really interesting and would also overall just make sense since that's also similar to what Whitebeard said. Doesn't it just make sense that Shanks has some sort of lineage of extremely strong pirates since he seems to have some of the strongest conquerors hockey in the entire series? I mean, it usually seems that all of the strongest and most important pirates in One Piece can have some sort of important family or clan. You don't just become a Yonko for no reason, you definitely need the strength or crew to back it up. Also, just speaking of the Yonko, there seems to be a strange trend with them and rocks. First off, Big Mom, Kaido, and Whitebeard were part of the rocks before they became emperors. Blackbeard lives on the same island that rocks lived on and he seems to be inheriting his will in some way. So since four of the original Yonko were connected to rocks, wouldn't it also make sense that Shanks is too? Shanks would make it 5 out of 5 Yonko until Buggy and Luffy also became them. Who knows, maybe Buggy and Luffy also have a connection to rocks, but as of right now, it doesn't seem like it. So now with everything that I've now explained, let me tell you why this is so important to Shanks as a character and why him being half of each side defines him so well. So remember earlier how I said that Shanks is based off of the Norse god of war? Well, let's go back to that idea of how Shanks is the guy who stops wars and acts as a peacemaker between the pirates and the government. With him being half celestial dragon, half will of D, he is the mediator between all. That's why he's a war stopper and a peacemaker. I believe in the final war, Shanks will not be directly attacking either the government or the pirates. I think he'll be in between since he has friends on both sides. For example, he will obviously help Luffy, but he'll attack and fight Blackbeard. Both are key to taking down Im sama but Shanks will still be in between even with his own clan. The one who inherited Rox's will ends up fighting Rox's very own son in the final war. It would just be ironic if the one that's trying to stop Blackbeard from achieving his dream is Rox's son himself. I feel like that would be something Oda would do to be honest. I mean, we do always see sons in One Piece going a different path from their fathers or grandparents. Even with the world government, I believe he'll fight alongside someone like Garp because he's his friend's grandparent. Shanks will pretty much side with any marine that doesn't go against Luffy, as in the first chapter, the whole purpose of the bar scene was to show how he deals with people and his intentions. Basically, if you mess with Luffy, he'll mess you up, and if you don't, then he's cool with you. That's why I can definitely see Shanks going against guys like Eam, the Gorosei, and certain admirals. I mean, if Shanks does have the will of D, it's only his destiny to fight them in the end, even if he is part Celestial Dragon. Basically, Shanks will just be an ally of Luffy, which is why I believe we should stop trying to say the theory that Shanks is a villain or that Shanks will turn on Luffy in the end. Honestly, I can't think of a single way that this happens because Oda already told us in the first chapter exactly how Shanks is as a character. Also, him being a Celestial Dragon with the Will of D could also be represented with what he's already done to the world government. First of all, he talked to the five elders in a secret meeting, discussing a certain pirate. This seems to be him showing off his celestial dragon side, as I don't see how they allow any Will of D member to meet with them unless they met a certain criteria. The other only thing we learned about, about what Shanks did to the world government, is when he stole the gum gum fruit from them. This is obviously showing his Will of D side, since that fruit seems to be directly tied with them and the Void Century. Logically speaking, I just want to first bring up how I never thought Blackbeard would be the moon god because he's an enemy of the sun god, Luffy. In mythologies, the moon isn't depicted as being an evil thing or an enemy to the sun. It's actually an ally of the sun and they coexist with each other to create the night and day. I mean, the moon even has light from the sun bouncing off of it, which lets us see it at night. This makes me believe that the moon god in One Piece would coexist with Luffy and be his friend. Now to explain how laws directly faded with the dawn of the world. The first major part of this theory is all about what the term dawn means symbolically. The dawn is the first appearance of light before sunrise. So when the dawn comes, the moon is usually still visible and the sun is also about to come up. So all in all, you can think of the dawn as a time in the day when both the moon and the sun are out. There's also another definition of the word dawn, which is the beginning of a phenomenon or period of time, especially one considered favorable. The theory revolves around both definitions 
so just keep in mind when hearing the next set of evidence. Okay, so now that you understand that, let's put it in One Piece terms. Chapter 601 is called Romance Dawn for the New World. This is a very interesting title because the Straw Hats aren't in the New World during this chapter, nor are they technically heading to the New World yet either. In this chapter, they are getting ready to head to Fishman Island. I believe this title is telling us that there will be a Romance Dawn when the Straw Hats begin their New World journey. Now, let's think about what the Romance Dawn of the New World would actually be. Wouldn't it begin when Luffy actually gets into the New World? So if this is true, then I would assume that the Romance Dawn began in the first arc of the New World, which is Punk Hazard. Punk Hazard is the beginning of this Romance Dawn because it's the first arc of the New World and also the arc where Luffy makes an alliance with Law. Or should I say, it's the Dawn because it's where the Sun God and the Moon God make an alliance. And now, let me ask you, what's the reason for Law wanting to become an ally of Luffy's. Oh yeah, that's right, to take down Kaido. And doesn't Toki tell the people of Wano that they are the moon unaware of the dawn? If you watched my huge One Piece theory, you'll know that Toki is referring to Wano as the moon and the dawn as the era when Luffy and Law saved them. We know Wano and its people are the moon that she was talking about because they are symbolized by a crescent moon. Every clan has a meaning tied to the moon. The word Wano sounds a lot like waning, which is a term to describe the moon's core size. And lastly, Wano's theme, which is played and written by Toki, is called Moon Princess. This song name shows us that she is the Moon Princess, or the Princess of Wano, which is the moon. I think Law being the one to think of this plan to take down Kaido shows us that it's his destiny by the D-Clan to save the moon, since he's the moon god. Just like how it's destiny by the D-Clan that Luffy will come to Wano and bring the dawn. This whole alliance overall was destined to happen because Luffy and Law are carrying the wills of ancient men. With this being said, I don't think Law realized that Wano is the moon or that they were even enslaved, but I think it's more so just a course of fate that the moon god had to take initial action into saving the moon. Luffy or Joy Boy may be the son to actually take down Kaido, but without Law's initial idea to go to Wano, Luffy would have never been able to do it, and therefore the Dawn would have most likely never come to Wano. This truly does show Law's impact and importance in the story. The Dawn that Toki was talking about was when Luffy and Law's alliance came to save them. She knew that they would come because Odin saw at the One Piece that Joy Boy and other primary figures would come and save Wano. Not only are Luffy and Law the two that will bring the Dawn to Wano, but also the two that will bring it to the world. They are the only current pirate alliance in the world that is slowly flipping the world upside down. Both Luffy and Law stand next to each other as captains, side by side in terms of respect, just like the sun and moon. Now Luffy obviously shines brighter than Law since he's the sun, but Law does all the unnoticeable work like setting up the plans to even go to Wano or to even take down a celestial dragon. Luffy and Law both look at each other as equals. Luffy relies on Law at times, like when we see Law save his life after Marineford. Was it fate that the only person in the world who could save Luffy at that time was there waiting for him and ended up helping him? I like to think that it may have been. Just like how Luffy relies and was even saved by Law, Law also relies on Luffy and was even saved by him. In Dress Rosa, Luffy saves Law from his biggest enemy. In this arc, we also learn that Law knows a bit about his fate in the world. He may not know about sun gods or moon gods, but he does know that the D-Clan has a certain destiny to take down the celestial dragons. I've also talked about in previous videos how I believe the will of D is the will of the dawn, since that's the only D word we really see people who found the One Piece bring up. I've also said how Oda told us that romanticism simply means believing or fantasizing in chapter 235. Notice how this chapter has the sun rising or the dawn. If romanticizing means believing and dawn means the air that Luffy and Law are bringing to the world, then romance dawn simply means the belief in the dawn. If that's the case, then the Will of D is a clan that believes that the dawn will come one day. It also means that the dawn clan inherited each other's wills for centuries and centuries because they are the ones that will bring the dawn. The dawn comes when the celestial dragons are defeated, which is why Korzone tells Law that those with the will of D 
are the direct enemies of the gods. You may think, well then what does this have to do with Blackbeard? Well trust me, it all perfectly connects to him as well, but I'll explain his true purpose and how he's also connected to the moon in the next video of this huge mega theory. With everything I just explained, think about it like this, Luffy and Law have an alliance. If the will of D means the will of the dawn, then their alliance is in fact the alliance of the dawn. The alliance of the dawn has both the moon god and the sun god. If you want to even tie it more with the romance dawn, there's an alchemical term that describes exactly what romance on is. There's an alchemical term which is called an alchemical wedding. In simple terms, this is a term describing a phase which turns base metals into gold and achieving the philosopher's stone. The ultimate purpose of this is immortality. And by the way, I'm not talking about full metal alchemist right now. I'm talking about lore from real life. I'm not trying to say whether you believe in this or not. All I'm saying is that Oda may have used it as a reference for his pirate story. So now you may ask, well what does this have to do with Luffy and Law? Well, the alchemical wedding is always symbolized by the union, or should I say, the alliance of the sun and the moon. Now, going back to Romance Dawn and how Luffy and Law are creating Romance Dawn, think of the term alchemical wedding. It's a wedding or a union of the sun and the moon. A wedding. Do you get it now? Since weddings are romantic, this is literally Romance Dawn, a marriage or union of the sun and the moon. I know for a fact that Oda had some inspiration off of this term because it's what One Piece is all about. Like I said before, this term describes the phase of achieving the Philosopher's Stone or immortality. Luffy and Law also both symbolize immortality as the sun and moon, but I'll get more into it later. Just remember this term because it's going to be brought back up with another major key point tying it to Lunarians. So now, if you still don't believe that Law is the moon god, let's decode his name. Notice how his first name is actually not just Law, but Water Law. Now, I think this is a hint by Oda since it's a hidden name that we don't learn about until later in the story. What do you think of when you hear the words Water Law? or Law Water. I personally see it as the Law of the Water, and what is the natural force that brings the Law of Water? Well, it's the Moon. The Moon brings the Law to every single source of water in the world. The Moon is the main cause or force of gravity that creates waves or tides. The Moon's gravitational law creates the Law of Water. Waves are in fact a Law of Water since they appear in every major water source in the world. With this being said, I don't find it a coincidence that Law's name seems to be directly directly tied to the moon just as many other hints. Now this next hint might be a little speculation, but you never know with Oda so I thought to include it. Let's be honest, Law's crew is pretty trash, and the only guy anyone even remembers is Beppo. Beppo as the right hand man to Law is a mink, which is a race of terrestrials that have direct ties to the moon as they become Sulongs on full moon nights. Now this might just be a coincidence but don't worry, because if you still don't believe Law's the moon got to Luffy's son, then you have to hear this next part out because it's the best evidence yet. Luffy and Law are two sides of the same coin. Not only that, but they are even more so than Luffy and Blackbeard. If you take a look at Luffy and Law's backstories, they prove this because they are basically the exact same thing. A kid Law looks up to Corazon. A kid Luffy looks up to Shanks. Corazon stole one of the most important devil fruits in the whole story from the world government and gives it to Law. Shanks steals one of the most important devil fruits in the whole story from the world government and actually accidentally gives it to Luffy. In Law's backstory, he is saved by Corazon. In Luffy's backstory, he's saved by Shanks. Law ended up being inspired to be just like Corazon, a pirate with connections to the Marines. Luffy ended up being inspired to be just like Shanks, a pirate that fights for his friends. Law ended up getting a tattoo that represents something from the backstory, which is Corazon. He also got a coat that says Corazon on it. Luffy ended up getting the straw hat, which is something that represents his meeting with Shanks. Law's pirate crew name is named after Corazon, since Corazon means hard in Spanish. Luffy's pirate crew name is named after something that Shanks gave him, which is the straw hat. With all these parallels in their backstories, I think it's fair to say that Oda is trying to tell us that Luffy and Law have a connection much deeper than we even realize. Some more parallels has to do with their devil fruits. First of all, as already stated, the world government wanted Law's fruit for themselves, and Luffy's as well. Law's fruit seems to be the most important devil fruit in the whole story. 
along with the Nika fruit since the price for it is apparently 5 billion berries. Yeah, you heard that right. Not million, but 5 billion. That's more than guys like Shanks, Blackbeard, Big Mom, and Kaido. It's already as much as Whitebeards and Rogers, which were guys that literally knew what the One Piece is. So apparently, to the world government, Lost Devil Fruit is almost as worth as much as someone who found the true history, the King of the Pirates. Now, if the fruit is this important to the world government, then maybe it is the fruit of a moon god. More actual parallels with the fruits is that specifically celestial dragons were the ones who said they wanted it, both Doflamingo and the Five Elders. Another parallel is that both times the secrets of the Apop fruit and Gumma Gumma Nomi were revealed, a celestial dragon was the one who told it. Doflamingo revealed that the Apop fruit can give someone immortality and is the key to finding the secret treasure of Marijoa. The Five Elders revealed that the Gumma Gumma Nomi is actually the human human fruit, model Nika, and has the most ridiculous power in the world. So since both devil fruits have so many parallels and are both known as the ultimate devil fruits and as having the greatest powers in the world, wouldn't it just make sense that since Luffy carries the will of a sun god, Law carries the will of a moon god. I even believe that as Law and Luffy fight against Doflamingo, it symbolizes how they will both fight against Emu and Bring the Dawn. If Law is the moon god, then I believe his fruit will allow him to find the secret treasure at Marijoa. I believe this treasure could be tied to Lunarians because Marijoa is on the red line, which is where they used to live. What if the celestial dragons built Marijoa right on top of where this treasure was hidden in the red line and waited to obtain the moon god's devil fruit to be able to use this power? This treasure seems to only work with the fruit itself, according to what Doflamingo says, which is, if I had the op, -op Nomi in my hands that day, I would have been able to use the national treasure of Marijoa to control the world itself. Law's ultimate destiny by the end of the series is to obtain the treasure that the moon gods left at the red line and save the world with it. Just like how Luffy's destiny is to obtain the treasure at Laugh Tale, which was left by the past sun god for the later sun god to obtain and save the world with it. This fate of both the sun god and moon god is also brought up by Odin. Odin claims that the primary figures of the great war that will come one day will split the seas themselves. My interpretation of this is that the great war will split the seas literally as the red line is destroyed. Now, if you've already watched my other videos, you know that Luffy and the One Piece has the power to split the seas since they are going to be the ones that gather up the ancient weapons and destroy the red line. If Odin is referring to the red line being destroyed, then I'd assume Law's Awakening will help this task too. I'd assume that when Law finds the secret treasure of Marijoa, it'll allow him to take down the red line along with Luffy and the ancient weapons. I feel like all of these have to do together and simultaneously or else the red line won't be brought down. Another guy that will probably help out with this is Blackbeard and his devil fruit. In my opinion, all of these abilities have the power to destroy the world in their own right, and if they work together, they will literally destroy the old world and bring the world that is in one piece. Anyways, going back to Law and Luffy being two sides of the same coin, they may have the exact same backstories and destinies that coincide with each other, but their personalities are complete opposites, just like how the sun and moon are. Law is a lot like his name. He lays down the law. He tells the Straw Hats what his plan is and that they have to perfectly execute it. Luffy is the complete opposite as he does whatever he wants with no plan whatsoever. I believe both together need to happen to properly bring the dawn. Law's personality is very serious, which is also like his name, Law. The law is usually a serious thing and Law himself is very serious, quiet, and calm. Luffy, on the other hand, acts like the sun or like a Leo. He is proud and loud. He is also like his name Luffy, which sounds like Laffy. He is always laughing and having fun, and at the same time making others laugh as well. Now, although their personalities are complete opposites, they still get along since they're both good guys, and have similar goals in taking down the Yonko. Just like how I said before, I wouldn't think that the moon god of One Piece would be an enemy of Luffy, since the moon isn't an enemy of the sun. I would think that the moon god would actually be an ally or friend, and not someone who's evil like Blackbeard. The next hints or connections with Law being the moon god will have to do with mythology from real life. The first parallel is with the Hindu moon god Chandra or also called Soma. This Hindu god Soma is the god of the moon. Now this is very interesting because Soma is also the name for the elixir of life in Hindu mythology. The moon was also thought to be the storehouse of the elixir of life. The legend goes that when the gods drink Soma or the elixir of life, the moon god begins to wane. For the final piece of evidence, I'll be explaining the real 
real-life inspirations of Oda's story and we'll start off by asking a few questions, seeing if you can guess the right answer. What is two sides of the same coin based on? What does it have to do with the moon or Lunarians? What inspired Oda to make the moon god fruit, one that can give someone immortality? Why are the moon gods of One Piece portrayed as fallen angels or demons with fire abilities? What one thing in the real world is the inspiration for all these key points? Well, there's only one thing that could have inspired the moon gods of One Piece, and it's this, the Baphomet. First off, notice how on the Baphomet, there's literally two crescent moons, one black, one white. These moons symbolize the two sides of the same coin, or what philosophers call symbolization of the equilibrium of opposites. The Baphomet is supposedly perfectly balanced, being half human, half beast, both male and female, and both good and evil. Apparently this image is supposed to represent balance and the goal of perfect social order. So basically the Baphomet symbolizes what we call in One Piece two sides of the same coin. We even see a white and black snake that also symbolize the same thing that's the opposite. We also see a torch on his head or what some call the flame of intelligence. This is another direct parallel with Lunarians because they are known to have fire powers with King even being called King of the Wildfire. With all this being said, now that you know that Oda most likely was inspired by this to create the moon gods, what does it have to do with law and the Apopnomi? Well, this term, two sides of the same coin, has a lot to do with the occult and immortality. Remember how before I talked about the alchemical marriage with the sun and moon? Well, this term is one for achieving what they call the Philosopher's Stone. This stone is known to be able to give you immortality. Doesn't that sound a lot like Law's Devil Fruit? To expand on immortality a bit more, in my opinion, One Piece is a story of the secrets to immortality. Romance Dawn is the alchemical marriage and both the moon god and sun god symbolize immortality. The op op no me symbolizes it in a way that is physically or earthly, like the physical body being immortal and never being able to die. The sun god symbolizes immortality in the soul and in will. I mean, apparently at the One Piece, you find out that even if you die, you don't actually die. We see Roger literally tell Ray Lee that he's not gonna die. Also, Dr. Kira Luck tells us that people only die when they're forgotten. Is a war of a literal immortal ruler of the world versus an immortal clan. The D clan or the Dawn clan is immortal since they passed on each other's wills for centuries. I can expand more on immortality in One Piece, but that should be for another video because it's getting a little off topic with Law and the Moon Gods. Also, a little detail that may have to do with Law's Devil Fruit and the Baphomet is that Law's Fruit is called the Ultimate Devil Fruit. Ultimate Devil Fruit. It truly does have the ultimate powers of the devil. And going back to Lunarians, wouldn't it just make sense that Emu the Immortal forced a Lunarian to make her immortal since she also lives on top of where they used to live? I also believe the Emerald City has to do with whatever happened to Emu and the Moon Gods since the Emerald City also may have something to do with immortality. With two sides of the same coin, alchemical marriage, and symbolization of the equilibrium of opposites, all representing the key to immortality, there's another phrase that is actually the original, which is, as above, so below. This is a phrase describing the secret to immortality written by Herms Trismegistus on the Emerald Tablets. I believe the Emerald City had the secrets to the moon gods because it probably had something to do with immortality and something that's based off of the Emerald Tablets. This all ties in with God Valley, Blackbeard, Rocks, NL, Skypea, Sun God Nika, the Oni race, and more. But that's for the next videos which are on the way. Throughout the entire story, Blackbeard always talks about this grand plan that he has. We see him tell Sengoku that from the beginning, he planned on becoming a Seven Warlord just to break out the prisoners of Impel Down. This grandmaster plan of his seems to be going well as of right now. According to him, fate has led him to everything he's done. But the main question would be, what even is this plan leading to? We know he's already gotten everything he's wanted from the prisoners, his territories, and of course, his devil fruits. But what is this all leading to? Well, I came to 
of the belief that Blackbeard's dream and plan is to become the king of the world while running a world of true freedom and anarchy. Not only this, but also to live as this king in his own world for eternity. You see, Blackbeard always brings up how after someone dies, it's all over for them. He doesn't really seem to care about things like will, the afterlife, or even honor. I know this is true because when he fights Ace, he offers Ace his hand and tells him to join him. After Ace rejects his offer, Blackbeard says, survival is the only thing that matters in the world, or in the Shonen Jump translation, once you're dead, nothing else matters. So as you can see, Blackbeard truly only cares about worldly values and about surviving for as long as he can. This truly ties in with almost everything that we know about him. For example, he stayed with Whitebeard for as long as he could to survive for as long as he could. He doesn't do anything unless he knows he'll succeed because he doesn't want to take the risk of dying. And lastly, he gets scared while in the face of death. Take a look at his face and reaction when Whitebeard is about to destroy him. He legitimately looks scared because he is. His biggest fear is to die, which is why there are times when we see his personality flip from being confident to acting scary. Another thing that could prove that Blackbeard wants to rule the world for eternity is that he cares about his era. We see that part of his plan is to begin his era, which is probably leading to maintaining his era. After he kills Whitebeard and steals his devil fruit abilities, he says that the era of Whitebeard is over now and that all the old generation is obsolete. He and his generation are replacing the old ones. With this logic, he should know that eventually time will pass by and another generation will pass him. So how do you prevent this from happening? Well, you not only have to remain the strongest, but you'd also have to be able to live forever. Blackbeard has a vision of the world and shows us a bit of this vision at the end of Marineford. There's a scene where he screams out to everyone to hear, quote, show it to the world, to all the boring, peace-loving citizens, to the Marines, to the world government, and to all the pirates out there. This world's future has been decided. Yes, from now on, this is my age. This dialogue shows us exactly what Blackbeard wants to do and what he believes the world should be. First off, notice how in the beginning of this speech, he calls the peace-loving citizens boring. This shows that he views simple peace as a boring thing. He seems to want a world that is full of chaos, anarchy, out of order and with all of this himself at the very top of it. I'd also expect he just wants a world full of criminal activity and whatever he thinks is fun because at Foolahead Island, he calls his island a pirate paradise and that it ought to be fun. Blackbeard probably wants to make the whole world his pirate paradise and a place that suits him. Another thing that could prove that Blackbeard wants a world of anarchy and basically as a whole pirate paradise has to do with Luffy. We all know that Luffy and Blackbeard are two sides of the same coin. When they first meet, Oda makes it pretty obvious that they are the same except also the complete opposite. So if this is true, then what if it's the same thing with their dreams? We know that Luffy's dream is to become the king of the pirates because he wants to be the most free man. So what would be the complete opposite of this? Well, the complete opposite of this would be that Blackbeard would want to become the king of the pirates to rule over the world. Another possibility that would be the complete opposite of Luffy's dream would be that Blackbeard may want to become the king of the world to make the whole world free from an anarchic perspective. Either one fits in my opinion. I also think he definitely wants to become the king of the world and not limit himself to king of the pirates because he's just the type of guy that always goes a step further. For example, even though he already had arguably the strongest devil fruit ever, he had to take it a whole step further and get the strongest paramecia ever. So why would he become the king of the pirates but not go to the next step which is the king of the world? In chapter 440, Blackbeard mentions to Ace that he will become the king of the pirates, which shows that it's definitely a part of his plan. I think he will attempt to do so, but the reason for this is to ultimately become the king of the world. In fact, the title for king of the pirates may be the king of the world in the world that Blackbeard wants to create, since it'll be a world of piracy and criminals. There won't be any world government, so that would make Blackbeard the ruler over all, unless someone else can defeat him. Another reason I believe Blackbeard wants to become the next ruler of the world is because he's brought up how he feels like he has the power to control the whole world. He also brings up how he's invincible and the greatest to ever do it. With this amount of narcissism and power backing it up, I believe it shows this is what he wanted all along. Now going back to what he said at Marineford, this speech also proves that he wants this dream world for eternity because he says the line, this world's future has been decided. Yes, from now on, this is my age. Notice how he says the world's future has been decided. He believes that he 
and his age has the whole world's future or fate in his hands. To have the whole world's future, you can't just have power, but also an enduring rulership for eternity. Once you die, your fate ends, but the world's fate continues to go on. The world's fate has to be an eternal thing because there is a never ending of days or time. This is also interesting considering the fact that the world's fate may actually be revolved around Luffy and not Blackbeard. Luffy seems to be the one who is bringing the dawn since he is the sun god. If you've seen my last part in this God Valley series, I bring up how I believe that Law is the moon god. I believe that he and Luffy were brought to Wano since they are sun and moon gods. I also state how I believe the will of D means the will of the dawn because for centuries upon centuries, the D clan have been inheriting each other's wills until the dawn arrives. I believe that when the dawn comes, there will no longer be a D clan because it will no longer be necessary since they already brought the dawn to the world. So with all this being said, what even is the dawn? Well, wouldn't the dawn be when the celestial dragons are defeated and when the truth is exposed to the whole world? Also, what even is the dawn in literal terms? Well, there's two main definitions and I believe that both define exactly what the dawn is in One Piece 2. The first definition is the first appearance of light in the sky before sunrise. Now what does this have to do with One Piece? Well, this has to do with exactly what will happen in the dawn of One Piece because at the time when the first appearance of light comes, there's still darkness from the night, the moon is still visible, and the sun's light is first shown. This is right before sunrise which shows that Luffy or the sun god isn't the only important figure that will bring the dawn to the world since there's a bit of sunlight, a bit of the moon, and a bit of the night's darkness at the dawn of the day. In One Piece, there will be the light of Luffy the sun god, the moon god Law, and the darkness of Blackbeard who will bring the dawn to the world. This is why Oda chose those three to be the new and final generation of people with the will of D. He chose to have the guy who represents darkness, the guy who represents the moon, and the guy that represents the sun to be the most important worst generation and will of D members. It is my belief that these three will be the ones to fight and defeat Emu and the celestial dragons. The reason for this is because back in Lost Flashback, Warzone told him that those with the will of D are the direct enemies of the gods and that their people's goal is the very destruction of the world. This is the same destruction of the world that Whitebeard was talking about and also Odin. Another destiny of Blackbeards may not only be to defeat the celestial dragons but to destroy the world literally. I believe he will literally destroy the world with the power to destroy the world along with the other will of D members. Odin claims that at the One Piece he found out that there will be a massive war terrible enough to split the seas themselves. In other words, in another 20 years, the primary figures of this great war will muscle their way into the new world. So we already know that the primary figures of the great war that is coming muscled their way into the new world when Blackbeard, Luffy, and Law went into the new world. So now that we know Odin already got this part of his prediction right, what could he mean by a war so massive that it will split the seas? Well, I believe that it means in this war, the red line will be destroyed and when it comes down, the seas will be split. When the red line is brought down, it is literally destroying the old world to make a new one with no red line or nothing dividing the world and oceans. The all blue will most likely come and other things as well. So now, how will Luffy, Blackbeard, and Law destroy the red line? Well, it is to my belief that they will use their devil fruits to do so. I also believe that the ancient weapons will help out with this as well since they are labeled as having the power to destroy the world. Okay, so now that you understand that I believe these three are the ones who will literally destroy the world and bring the dawn, let's take a look at the second definition of dawn. The second definition of dawn is the beginning of a period of time, especially one considered favorable. So the beginning of a new era will happen after the celestial dragons are defeated and after the red line is destroyed, or in other words, a dawn will come. Okay, so now the real question is, which era? After Emu is exposed and defeated, will it be Luffy's era or Blackbeard's? Since we know that their destiny is to defeat the celestial dragons and destroy the world, I don't see any of the three dying to a celestial dragon or during their fight with the celestial dragons. After the throne of Emu is destroyed, someone else might take it. This is where I start to believe that Luffy's final fight will not be with Emu but actually Blackbeard as we know that Blackbeard's ultimate goal is to take the throne of the world as he says excitedly in chapter 925 that the mighty battle for supremacy over the throne has already begun. This battle has officially started and it will officially end when Luffy defeats Blackbeard and all of those in his way of being Pirate King to get the throne of the world 
world, and in the way that Blackbeard wants it, he will not only need to defeat Emu, but he'll also have to force Law to perform the Eternal Youth operation on him. The next connection with Blackbeard killing Law has to do with the real Blackbeard, whom Teach seems to be based off of. This connection is pretty crazy, so prepare to be mind blown. So the real Blackbeard has arguably the most known and famous Jolly Roger in the world. Take a look at it, and what do you see? Well, I personally see a devil or demon stabbing a heart. So isn't it almost like the flag is representing some demon killing a heart? And now you may ask, well what does this have to do with One Piece? Well, it has to do with One Piece because Oda may use it as a reference for Blackbeard killing the captain of the Heart Pirates. Not only is Law the captain of the Heart Pirates, but he's overall just represented by a heart. I mean, he has a heart tattoo on his chest. He ate a devil fruit that's shaped like a heart. He was saved and inspired by Corazon, whose name means heart in Spanish. And lastly, the coat that he wears has the name of Corazon on it, which again means heart in Spanish. So could Oda use the real Blackbeard's Jolly Roger as a reference or inspiration for his pirate story. He tends to use a lot of things, so I wouldn't be surprised if he used this as well. So now that we know how Blackbeard will most likely become immortal, let's talk about how this is connected with another person who also seems to be immortal. So if Lost Devil Fruit actually is the fruit from a moon god, wouldn't that explain a lot how Emu became immortal? We know one thing for sure, which is that Whitebeard claims that Lunarians used to live atop the red line, where Marijua is placed. Assuming that Lunarians were extinguished by the Celestial Dragons and Emu, wouldn't it make sense that Emu forced one of them to make her immortal? Wouldn't it also make sense that the treasure of Marijua is there because a former Lunarian left it there? A Lunarian may have used the powers of the op, -op fruit to place the sacred treasure of Marijua in the Red Line. Maybe that's why Pangaea Castle is located there because they want to be right on where the treasure is located so they can't lose it or let someone else obtain it. Maybe if a Lunarian used Law fruit to place the treasure there. That's also why Law's Devil Fruit or the Devil Fruit of a Moon God is the only thing that can allow someone to obtain this treasure. It almost seems that Emu and the present gods of the world had to wipe out and destroy the old kingdom of gods to make their new kingdom of gods. Wouldn't it also make sense that Kaido named King King because the Moon Gods might be responsible for making people kings. It could either be this or the fact that Alunarian was once the king of the world but there definitely seems to be some sort of connection with Lunarians and Emu. If there is a connection with Lunarians and Emu, it would tie in very well with one of the most famous Japanese stories, which is called The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter, famously known for its main character Kaguya, the princess from the moon. In this story, there seems to be many parallels with Emu. First off, there are five nobles that are trying to marry Kaguya, just like how in One Piece, there's five elders who work for Emu. Next, Kaguya came from the moon, kind of like how Emu may have came from the moon, or at least from space, given their names Celestial Dragons, making it seem as if she came from space. Another connection is that when Kaguya went to the moon, she took the potion of immortality. Kind of like how when Emu went to the moon gods, she took the eternal youth operation. Another parallel is somewhat actually flipped in One Piece, but it seems to still work because it's the same thing as in One Piece, just the opposite. So the fourth connection would be that Kaguya ended up losing all her memory. In One Piece, I'm not quite sure if Emu lost her memory or not, but we do know that she erased everyone else's memory. The last connection seems to be a bit more of a stretch, but still represents Emu in a way through multiple connections. In the story, Kaguya wore a feathered cloak as she went back to the moon and while forgetting her memory. So in One Piece terms, this may parallel Doflamingo as he wears a feathered cloak and as he erases people's memories with the powers of sugar. We all know how Doflamingo parallels Emu with him being a celestial dragon that rules Dress Rosa, just like how Emu rules the world. He tricked the people by taking away their memories. Emu tricked the world by erasing the Void Century. Dofi wanted the sacred treasure of Marijoa. Emu has it. Dofi wanted Lost Fruit to also be immortal, and then Emu is immortal. I think everyone understands how Dofi represents Emu in a way, and the feathered cloak may be yet another clue from Oda about Emu's connection to Kaguya. Basically, if these connections are actual inspirations for Oda, it may prove that Emu did end up getting her immortality from a moon god. Some more parallels and hints with Emu and the Celestial Dragons could be from Drum Island. Uteron states that both Drum Island and Marijua are parallel. 
Ilos. First off, the chapter that Emu's name is introduced and when we see Emu sit on the throne is 908, which in Japanese, the kanji can be read as Ku Re Ha, just like Dr. Kureha in Drum Island. Dr. Kureha also symbolizes Emu since she's a life-expanding woman who lives in the Drum Island castle, just like how Emu may have expanded her lifespan and lives in Pangaea Castle. Something else that connects Emu with Kureha is that Emu in Japanese can be read as Buddha. The only two characters in One Piece that are known for the Buddha are symbolized by the maple leaf. Now you may say, well what does this have to do with Dr. Kureha? Well, because Dr. Kureha in Japanese literally means maple leaves. Another parallel in this arc could be that the 20 doctors of the Drum Island Kingdom could symbolize the 20 royal families of celestial dragons. So basically, if the Drum Island Kingdom symbolizes Marijoa, then I believe the arc foreshadows and symbolizes the ending of One Piece. In case you forgot, in Drum Island, Blackbeard comes in and destroys the kingdom. Dalton says how the citizens say how Blackbeard's destruction actually may have been for the better since Wapo left the country because of this. So maybe this foreshadows how Blackbeard would destroy Marijoa and the Celestial Dragons and how even though Blackbeard is a villain, what he did may actually be better for the citizens of the world since most people hate and are terrified of the Celestial Dragons. Now why would Blackbeard even be at Drum Island? Every single thing that he does seems to be part of some great master plan and him going to Drum Island and destroying their kingdom doesn't make much sense unless there was a reason for him to do it. Well, what if this reason was that he was trying to find the secrets of immortality, life expansion, or something that can heal any disease, even death? The Drum Kingdom is known for being the kingdom of doctors. Maybe Blackbeard thought that they would have some sort of leads to immortality or could have even had the secrets itself. Dr. Kureha and her everlasting age abilities could have definitely been useful for what he was looking for, but he may have not even found her because she's secretive and hides away from the public. Also, maybe Blackbeard also heard the rumor of the cherry blossoms and wanted to find something about them in Drum Island. If the cherry blossoms could heal any disease, then maybe they can even cure the disease in which everyone is born with, which is aging. Theoretically, if the cherry blossoms can cure anything, then they may even be able to prevent death itself. Blackbeard may have searched for any information on any of these subjects while at Drum Island. So now continuing with Blackbeard and Emu, there are some definite parallels that involve what may have happened with Emu back in the Void Century and with what Blackbeard may end up doing. Just like how Emu killed and destroyed the Kingdom of Gods on top of the Red Line and then achieved her immortality from a Moon God which led to her rulership of the world and her era, maybe Blackbeard will do or is planning to do a similar thing. Blackbeard may or at least might be planning to destroy a kingdom of gods on top of the red line, achieve his immortality from a moon god or moon god fruit, and then become the king and ruler of the world. If Blackbeard ruled the world, it would be a world of darkness just like it was with Emu. The 800 year reign of celestial dragons seems to be symbolized as the night with no sun, no moon, and no dawn. Just like how if Blackbeard ruled, there would be no sun god, no moon god, and no dawn. This leads me to my next point which is what will really happen with Blackbeard in the endgame. Okay, so basically, I believe the whole story of One Piece is symbolized by the celestial rotation of the Earth and Sun. It is basically symbolizing each day. I believe the ancient kingdom which worshipped or was ruled by the Sun God was symbolized as the daytime or as noon. It was the day because the sun was still out and shining. After this, the Void Century came. The Void Century is symbolized by the dusk because the sun is coming to an end. End. The pirate shanty, Bing Sake, proves this theory even more. There's a line in Bing Sake which is, Evening comes, it's time to sound the drums. This shows that when the evening comes, or should I say, when the void century comes, it's time to sound the drums because the ancient kingdom and Joy Boy have to go to war and sound the drums of liberation. The next lines in Bing Sake are, But steady men and never fear. Tomorrow skies are always clear. So pound your feet and clap your hands till sunny days return. This is referring to the people that carry on the wills of the ancient kingdom, possibly the D-Clan, for they should stay steady and never fear. Even during the reign of Emu, which seems to be symbolized by the night, the night of 800 years, the lines, tomorrow skies are always clear, so pound your feet and clap your hands, till sunny days return, is referring to the reign of Luffy, the future pirate king. Once the sun god defeats everyone, the air of his will be symbolized as the next day. The dawn is the time frame from when the first appearance of light shows up. The first 
first appearance of Luffy. After Luffy defeats everyone, it will no longer be the dawn, but instead, it will be the day or the noon. So now, you may ask, well, what does any of this have to do with Blackbeard? Well, I believe something that Blackbeard will do will be symbolized by a celestial event. I personally believe that when Blackbeard forces Law to make him immortal, this event will be symbolized as an eclipse. Before I tell you why, let me first explain what a solar eclipse even is. A solar eclipse happens when the moon covers the sun. It's when the moon, sun, and earth are all aligned. So basically, I believe this will symbolize what will happen in One Piece because if Blackbeard kills Law and uses him, the moon god will get in the way of the sun god and darkness will prevail momentarily. This will happen after the dawn because in order for an eclipse to happen, the sun has to be fully out. This may be the beginning of the next day in One Piece, which will lead to Luffy having to defeat Blackbeard immediately after Emu. After Luffy defeats Blackbeard, the moon will no longer be in the way of the sun, and darkness, or Blackbeard, will not take over the world. This will be the era that Roger, Odin, and Joy Boy have been waiting for. The day with the light never stops shining. Something that may foreshadow this is chapter 545, which is titled, To Sunshine and Freedom. In this chapter, Luffy and Blackbeard both lead the breakout of Impel Down, and the prisoners finally see the sunshine after ages of being locked up in prison. This may symbolize how Luffy and Blackbeard are both involved in the freedom of the world and in bringing the next day. I'm not exactly sure how Luffy will defeat Blackbeard after everything goes down, but I have a feeling that a guy that powerful and crazy can't stick around. I can see a situation where maybe Luffy defeats him, but I don't think Luffy will kill him because he never kills anyone. Maybe Blackbeard's ultimate defeat will be by himself. He may ironically kill himself with the overuse of devil fruit powers or by something insane. We even see how Whitebeard tells him that his biggest weakness is his own overconfidence and carelessness. These may lead to the overall downfall of Blackbeard as he ultimately loses to himself. Lunarians are an extinct god race that once lived on the red line even before the celestial dragons. This means during or even before the void century. Arbor or king from Kaido's crew seems to be one of, if not the only, remainder from this race. We know the world government have an interest in him as it's implied that he was being tested on similar to Kaido when they were both captured. We also know that they are interested in him because they will pay for any information on king. One thing to know is that king and Kaido are both men members of very rare races and they both have knowledge and interest in Joy Boy. Lunarians are known for being tough and withstanding crucial living conditions. They also have the power of firebending exploding into flames, as this is how Marco first speculated of King's race. Other features include black wings, white hair, dark skin, and a tattoo that King has on his face. Luna is Spanish for moon and Lunaria is Latin for moon, so there does seem to be a link between the Lunarians and the moon. Now all of this will be important later on in the video so keep it at the back of your mind for now. God Valley was an island that is famous for the God Valley Incident, an event where the legendary Rocks pirate planned a massive heist, an attack on the world government as Rocks planned to rule the world by becoming the king. Roger and Garp ended up teaming up and protecting Celestial Dragons as they fought against Rocks Dizabek and his crew. This crew had members like Whitebeard, Kaido, Big Mom, and many others. Since then, the island has mysteriously vanished and is now extremely classified to very specific individuals who were there and people that can remember this era. And it's suspicious because Sengoku states that this was an island that the world government already wanted hidden. I mentioned how Kaido may have named King to pay respects to his Captain Rocks who wanted to become King of the World. I've been saying this for quite some time now and I actually ended up being right in a sense that Kaido did give him his name King as we see Kaido gave him his name the Day of Freedom. Then Jack and Queen follow suit. So for now I'm just waiting to see if the Rocks part is true. If Lunarians are indeed tied to God Valley, this would also make this even more important. Now let's get straight into the theory. Is it a coincidence that the only characters to have shown any knowledge of King's race are Whitebeard, Kaido, and Big Mom? That's right, all of these three members were once part of the Rocks crew. And this is a good place to start as I believe the Rocks crew learned about the Lunarians at God Valley. It's possible that there was a pony glyph that explains the truth of what happened at the island. And God Valley sounds fitting to be the perfect place that the God race of Lunarians once occupied. Whitebeard is shown to only bring up these guys gods when he's drunk. And then there's Big Mom who's collecting these different races like if they're Pokemon. 
and she immediately recognizes that King is a Lunarian as she says he is one of the missing races of her collection. She even asks King to join her crew. And then there's Kaido who recognizes King as a Lunarian immediately when he first met him. How would he know what a Lunarian looks like or why does he even know about the Lunarian's importance in the first place? Well my guess is that these three characters all learn about the Lunarians either from rocks directly or from the legendary God Valley incident. King and Kaido's meetings feels faded in a sense to remainders of these ancient races that have been wiped out completely. Go check out my Oni Extinction video later to understand the full context of the Oni race being genocided and being wiped away as well. So I'll ask you once again, is it a coincidence that Whitebeard, Big Mom, and Kaido are the only characters shown in the story to share the knowledge of the Lunarian race? Well, Rayleigh would say no. Remember, there are no such thing as coincidences in this world. To back this idea up further, God Valley and the Rocks were first brought up in the same arc that we learn about the Lunarians. And you might be saying, well, what about Marco and Queen? Don't they also technically know? Yes, but that is because they are commanders to these Yonko. Now to further my point about the Rox being tied to the history of the Lunarians, I've always wondered if Rox was actually a Lunarian. It would make sense that the strongest pirate in the seas has the natural durability and genes of a god. And this may be unlikely since it didn't seem like he had wings, but you never know, maybe he ripped them off. Anyways, even if he wasn't a Lunarian, I believe that one reason that he decided to plan the heist was because he was seeking the information about the Lunarians at God Valley so that he could expose the truth about the Void Century and the Celestial Dragons. In Japanese, God Valley is pronounced Godobare, which means the land of the gods were exposed. And so this is why I believe that even if Rox was not a Lunarian, one reason why he decided to plan the heist was because he was seeking the information about what happened to the Lunarians at God Valley so that he could expose the truth about the Void Century and the Celestial Dragon's rise to power. His goal was to take them down so that he could sit atop the throne for himself. In order to become the king, you would have to know about the king and then take down the king. But the proof that Rox always knew about Lunarians comes from his Jolly Roger, the symbol of his piracy. As you can see, Rox Jolly Roger represents three different possibilities. First, the Oni race, symbolized through the Devil Horns, which goes with my previous Oni race extinction video and would make sense as to why he was interested in recruiting Kaido if this is the case. The other possibility is that this is actually a flame design instead of Devil Horns as we see that there is a red skull in the anime with a swirl, the flame representing the Lunarians, and the last possibility I see is the design is intentionally meant to be both, mixing the Lunarian flames into the Oni horns. So making this a symbol, what do you think about it? Is this evidence that Lunarians are tied to the rocks narratively? Kaido's held a grudge against Celestial Dragon, so if both of these races became extinct during the Void Century because of genocides committed by Celestial Dragons, this would all be fitting with King as the right hand man helping Kaido fulfill his ambitions to rage war against these false gods. What if I told you that the Great War during the Void Century began with Lunarian Genocide? It would make sense that Celestial Dragons would target the Lunarians first, these were threats as they would claim the throne after defeating the gods, replacing them upon the red line. Lunarians are a race of moon gods with Luna meaning moon, and Celestial Dragons are similar with Celestial meaning heavenly or referring to space, and dragons being godlike figures, especially in Japanese culture and mythology. And then there's Eam, who is the king of the gods, get it? King and gods? It's likely that God Valley has ties to the Void Century and the One Piece as a world government wanted to keep it hidden even before and so to understand why Lunarians are the first extinguished light or the first genocide that began the war of the Void Century, we have to look at the Oharans. Ohara was another extinguished light as they were wiped away with only Robin surviving. In fact, there are many parallels between Robin and King that Oda is painting for us and that is the first of many. Let me ask you, how do you extinguish a fire? That's right, with a fire extinguisher. I believe the Celestial Dragons continue to use this very specific term, extinguish the light, because they are literally extinguishing the light by massacring the Lunarians who are known for their flames. Fire represents light and so does the moon in the night. So after this event, the Celestial Dragons always refer to these great cleansings, these big genocides as extinguished lights. Going back to Nico Robin, she is a survivor of another cleansing, the Ohara Incident, where they erased Ohara and the artifacts that held the secrets. All of their people 
and their culture being washed away forever. And she is also known as the Light of the Revolution, another possible reference at O'Hara being a distinguished light as she carries on their wheels, reading the pony glyphs, and one day learning the true history. King's black wings are meant to resemble a fallen angel going along with the god theme, and then Nico Robin is the devil child and is now shown with her devil form. As you can see, there are many interesting parallels between King the Last Onarian and Robin the Last O'Haran. And while the O'Harans were learning the truth about the ancient kingdom, it is likely that the Lunarians are connected to Joy Boy in the ancient kingdom during the void century. So this is why I believe Lunarians were wiped out as they once ruled upon the Red Line, and this started a world war with the Celestial Dragons declaring war against the ancient kingdom, ultimately sitting upon the throne. With Godobare meaning the land that exposes the gods, this is actually mind blowing because it goes along with the narrative perfectly. You might be wondering, how did the Lunarians live at God Valley if they lived on the Red Line? Well, it's possible that God Valley used to be part of the Red Line, or maybe God Valley is simply where the remaining surviving Lunarians lived quietly and peacefully. Or maybe it's just a pony glyph that speaks of the past existence of the Lunarians so that their history would not be erased. And so now it's time to tie it back into the Oni race. In my ancient giant extinction theory, I explain how the Oni, Zunisha's race, dinosaurs, and dragons were wiped out during the war. I explain how the O'Harans figured out that the enormous kingdom was ruled by an alliance between the Onis and Lunarians. The Onis were a great cleansing similar to the Lunarians, but why the Lunarians being the original extinction is important is because this event may have infuriated the Onis and Joy Boy to launch a war against the Celestial Dragons. It could be the initial motivating event and factor bringing everyone in the world at odds. It's possible that this war lasted decades, maybe even a hundred years, because we know that these ancient giants can live for that long. And so even if it was half a century long, it could still fit somewhere within the void century that was erased. And this is the beginning to the story of the Celestial Dragon Conquest. And it would be a terrifying secret to hide because if the world knew what it cost to become gods, if the world knew that they gained their power through mass genocide, it would spin an entirely different perspective on these corrupted people. So you let me know in the comments, have I convinced you that the Lunarians are from God Valley? Is there a pony glyph or some kind of evidence there that explains their downfall from god status to extinction? In chapter 224, Bellamy tells us of a legendary place called the Emerald City. He speaks on it as if it's some sort of legend just like Skypiea and the One Piece. He believes that they're just legends because almost no man has gone to these places except for legendary explorers like the Pirate King. Since in the story we've seen for ourselves that the City of Gold and the One Piece are real, we could only assume that the Emerald City is also real. But what kind of city could it be where we only heard of it once in the entire story? Well, I'd assume that it's a city that was erased from history. And that also reminds me of another place and event that was also erased from history, which was the incident at God Valley. So what if God Valley is the legendary Emerald City? I think it is, especially since it looks like an identical outline to the actual Emerald City in The Wizard of Oz. I saw this on a Reddit post a while back and I believed it the instant I saw it. So now, well, why does this matter? What does the Emerald City have to do with why rocks went to God Valley? Well, every Ever since I saw that reddit post, which was about a year ago, I figured that God Valley had the secrets to immortality. I believe the Emerald City will have something to do with the Emerald Tablet. In real life, ancient Egypt has a legend of something called the Emerald Tablet, written by Herms Trismegistus, and it tells you how to achieve immortality. Medieval alchemists associated the Emerald Tablet with the creation of the Philosopher's Stone and the artificial production of gold, which are things that can be created when you learn the secrets to immortality. So how would the Emerald City have the Emerald Tablet? Well, I was thinking that God Valley could have had a Poneglyph or some ancient relic that tells the reader how to achieve immortality. I believe that it tells the reader how to specifically perform the Eternal Youth operation using the op, op Nomi. Now if this was the place where you could learn how to become immortal, wouldn't that also explain why Rox wanted to go there in the first place? Sengoku told us that Rox's ambition was to become the king of the world. Now how do you 
become the king of the world in One Piece, wouldn't you have to overthrow the world government and the actual king of the world? And doesn't it seem that the actual king of the world, who goes by the name of Emu, is in fact immortal? Also, another thing that the Op Op Nomi can do is allow someone to use the national treasure of Marijoa and control the world itself. In other words, it can allow someone to become the king of the world. Maybe you also learn about this at God Valley. I think the reason for this has to do with the original king or kings of the world even before Emu and I'll explain more about it throughout the video. But even with all this being said, it really does seem that God Valley had something to do with becoming the king of the world. Not only because Rox wanted to go there, but also because God Valley in Japanese can be translated as the gods exposed. The word used for valley is pronounced bare and it means exposed. So if this is the place where the gods are exposed, maybe they're exposed there because it shows proof of the original gods which are the Lunarians. The proof of Lunarians would truly expose the celestial dragons since it would show that there was once a time where they weren't the gods of the world. It even seems that the celestial dragons took everything the Lunarians had since they took their home of the red line. They also erased them from history and give high rewards for even information on their race. Maybe the reason they're scared of people finding out about their existence is because just like the ancient kingdom, it would change the public's view on the world. It is also my belief that a Lunarian was the king of the ancient kingdom and this may be yet another reason why they don't want people finding out about them. I believe the reason Kaido named Albert King is because he found out the truth at God Valley and called him what one of his ancestors were. With this being said, I also want to make it clear that the king of the ancient kingdom doesn't seem to be Joy Boy. I believe Joy Boy was the previous or possibly even the first king of the pirates and I just can't see someone with the model Nika fruit being a king or political ruler of such a massive nation. Although Joy Boy may not be the king of the ancient kingdom, he was still definitely associated with the ancient kingdom and boy is there many hints to it. It's kind of like how Luffy is friends with everyone in the world but isn't a ruler or anything of that sort. He just lives freely and has fun. I will explain who I believe Joy Boy was later in the video and what it has to do with rocks and God Valley. Evidence of the Lunarian's race at God Valley also makes sense since the only people who even know of their existence are former rocks members. We see Whitebeard bring them up to Marco. Big Mom say that she needs King's race to be a part of her family and Kaido making King his right hand man. They may have all learned about this race that was extinguished from history at the God Valley incident. Another way God Valley could have exposed the gods is by the Poneglyph. Just like how I said the Poneglyph that was there may be based off of the Emerald Tablet. Well what if it does tell you how to do both the Eternal Youth Operation and how to obtain the Sacred Treasure of Marijua but in a story format. We know that one type of the Poneglyphs is a historical Poneglyph. I believe there's a Poneglyph at God Valley which tells the reader how Emu became immortal by forcing a Lunarian to do the operation. How Emu overthrew the Lunarians and lastly where the Sacred Treasure of Marijua is, how to obtain it and what it can do. I've already explained in my part 2 video of this Mega God Valley series why I believe Lost Fruit, the Op Op Nomi, is the fruit that carries on the will of the Lunarians. To recap just a bit of why this could be true, wouldn't it just make sense that a Lunarian was the one that placed the Sacred Treasure at Marijua since they used to live there? I mean there definitely seems to be some sort of connection with the Celestial Dragons and the Lunarians since they chose to live exactly where the Lunarians used to live. What if the only reason they even live on top of the Red Line is because the Treasure of Marijua was placed there? It seems that you can't obtain the treasure unless you have the fruit that a moon god may have used to place it there in the first place. Also, like I said in part 2, it seems that Law is destined by the will of D to find his own treasure or his own One Piece. Just like how the sun god left the One Piece for the next sun god to find, it seems that Law is destined to carry on the will of the moon god and find the treasure that a moon god left for a future will of D member with the same fruit to find. So if the Poneglyph at God Valley can expose any of this, it would make sense with everything that I've now explained and it would also make sense why the celestial dragons wanted to already hide God Valley from the world. Yeah, that's right. The world government already didn't want anyone to know the existence of God Valley even before Rox went there. Sangoku tells us that after the event took place, they erased it all from history. He describes that they erased Rox from history because he broke one too many taboos. This definitely seems to be the taboo that ultimately erased him from history since they erased both him and the island itself from the history books. He definitely learned something key to the void century on that island and it is 
is to my belief that he had someone who could read poneglyphs. The God Valley incident was about 15 years before the Ohara incident, so Rox could have definitely had someone from Ohara who could read the ancient language. In fact, one of the biggest questions to me and the God Valley incident that no one ever brings up is how the hell did Rox even learn about its existence and that going there would make him the king of the world? In fact, how did he even learn that there is such a thing as a king of the world? Wouldn't you have to learn about Emu's mere existence to have the ambition to overthrow his or her rulership? For example, Doflamingo also wanted to become the king of the world, but he's the type of guy that would know about Emu since he's a former celestial dragon and since he saw things like the sacred treasure. So how did Rox learn about such things? Well, it is my belief that he may have had a former celestial dragon on his crew that leaked secret knowledge on the world government and on God Valley. In part one of this theory, I explained why I believe that Shanks is half celestial dragon and half will of D and why Rox might be his father. I also explain how if this happened, then Shanks may have been found and picked up by Roger on God Valley. So if Rox himself had a wife or at least a crew member that was a former celestial dragon and that knew the secrets to God Valley and the world government, then maybe she told him where God Valley is, why he should go there, and lastly, that he can become the king of the world. Another possible explanation to Rox's ambitions could be that either he himself was an archaeologist and historian or someone on his crew was. An Oharan could have told him about such legends since we do learn from Professor Clover that you can learn things about the Void Century not only from Poneglyphs but also from ancient manuscripts and books. Maybe an Oharan found out about the existence of something key to God Valley like Lunarians, Imusama, or something along those lines. So now that you understand why I think Rox went to God Valley, now let me explain what it has to do with the ancient kingdom, Joy Boy, and most importantly, Skypea. So I believe that the City of Gold and God Valley are direct parallels with each other and that God Valley may even be the true left eye of Jaya. So to start my reasons why, let me tell you why I believe they are both connected with Ors the First, whom I believe to be Joy Boy. If you've already heard the Ors is Joy Boy theory before, then skip to this timestamp. So I believe Ors the First is Joy Boy. And by the way, I call him Ors the First because I believe that the Ors in Thriller Bark was actually Ors the Second. The reason I believe this is because Ors Jr. is actually Ors the Third. I explain this relationship between the Ors family better in my other videos, so I recommend checking out those videos if you're interested. I mainly believe Ors was Joy Boy for many reasons, and one of them is because Ors' introduction scene in Thriller Bark is identical to the giant straw hat scene during the Reverie. You see Moria walk into a giant freezer, just like how Emu walks into a giant freezer. Moria is carrying Luffy's shadow. Emu is carrying Luffy's wanted poster. After this, Moria puts Luffy's shadow into Ors, showing that the Ors race is connected with Luffy or Joy Boy. Also, take a look at Luffy's shadow during the very first time we see Ors. Look familiar? Oh yeah, that's right. It looks exactly like the Sun God Nika shadow that Oda drew when Luffy became Joy Boy and when explaining the Sun God Nika with who's who. This isn't just the only panel that Oda does this to. Go read chapters 456 and 457 and see for yourself that when we see Ors for the first time, Oda deliberately drew the shadow of Sun God Nika or Joy Boy over and over again in multiple panels. So going back to the parallels with the giant straw hat scene, all these hints may prove that that straw hat belonged to someone from the Ors race. Okay, so the next hint that Ors the first was Joy Boy is that Ors Jr. wore a giant straw hat hinting that an Ors from the Void Century may have been the owner of the giant straw hat. The next hint is that Ors' kanji or spelling in Japanese is the same exact spelling as the name of the Norse sun god in certain translations. Okay, so now for the next hint of Joy Boy has to do with God Valley, Shandora, Rox, Roger, Blackbeard, and Luffy. If God Valley is directly tied to the ancient kingdom, then it wouldn't only be connected with Lunarians, but also Joy Boy. So the first connection with these guys has to do with their names. If you dissect the connection of Roger, Rox, and Orz's names, then it starts to seem that Oda named them things so specifically to show that they are connected with each other. So first, let's look at all their first names. Roger, Orz, and Zebek. In case you don't know, the three of these words are all connected to a pirate ship. The word Roger is connected with pirates since it's the word for pirate flags, Jolly Roger. Orz is the word for the sticks that pirates and sailors use to steer and propel their ships or boats. So what does a Roger and Orz belong to? Well, that would be a Zebek. Zebek is the word for a small three-mast 
Mediterranean ship, or in simple terms, a pirate ship. So now that you see how their first names are connected, now let's also look at their last names. I will use the word gold for Roger, since the first time we see his name, it is Gold Roger and not Gold D. Gold D is also just an obvious wordplay that Oda did with the word gold. There's also another reason why, but I'll explain that in a bit. So gold is obviously an element that comes from the earth. Same thing with the word rocks. What happens when you take gold and rocks and put them together? Well, you would end up with golden ores, spelled as an O-R-E-S. Gold and rocks put together creates golden ore. So now that it seems that Oda made very specific connections with the three of these characters' names, there's even more connections which have to do with the Wizard of Oz. We know that Oda uses many references from big and well-known stories like The Boy That Cried Wolf, Journey to the West, Pinocchio, and countless others. Knowing this, I'd be surprised if he didn't have any Wizard of Oz references and I think I actually found proof that he does have them. So Goldie Roger represents the yellow brick road in the Wizard of Oz. As mentioned before, his name was originally Gold and it's also a pun with Goldie. Next has to do with the description of the yellow brick road. In the Wizard of Oz, it says they are currently striding along the yellow brick road to fame, the first step on the yellow brick road to fame and riches. Now, doesn't this sound somewhat familiar? Notice how the very single first page of One Piece says, Gold Roger, the king of the pirates, had achieved it all. Wealth, fame, and power had all been his. In another English translation, it says, Wealth, fame, power. Once there was a man who took everything in this world, Pirate King, Gold Roger. So as you can see, Goldie Roger symbolizes the yellow brick road in One Piece since he achieved wealth and fame which is exactly what it leads to in The Wizard of Oz. The third and final hint that shows that Roger has some inspirations from the yellow brick road is that he went to the city of gold. The yellow brick road is a road made out of gold just like how he was the one to find the city of gold in Skypea and even wrote a message on the gold belt Free. Okay, so now that you understand how he represents the yellow brick road, now to why Rox is connected to the Emerald City in the Wizard of Oz. So as I said before, it seems that God Valley is the legendary Emerald City that Bellamy was talking about. Now this is obviously connected to Rox since he was the one who committed and is remembered by the God Valley incident. So now that Roger represents the yellow brick road and Rox the Emerald City, how is this connected with Oars? Well, it's connected to Oars since Oars' name is actually men to be Oz, just like the Wizard of Oz. In many translations, you'll see that Oz's name is actually spelled Oz, O-Z. This is simply because his name in Japanese is pronounced the exact same as Oz in the Wizard of Oz. In Japanese, it is pronounced Azu. So how and why did Shonen Jump translate Azu into Oz instead of simply calling him Oz? Well, what if Oda himself deliberately told them to do it that way for all of these wordplay connections that I have now connected. We know how Oda loves his wordplay and if you've seen any of Uteron's or Ohara's videos on it, you'll see how far he's willing to take it. Also, by the way, in case you don't know, this is how I received my name, the Wizard of Oars. It's a pun from my very first video. So now, if you thought that those were the last connections with Oars, Roger, and Rox, then well sorry, but there's somehow even more. For these next connections, I will also be adding Luffy and Blackbeard into them since they seem to be carrying on the wills of Roger and Sebek in a way. So for the next one, Luffy and Roger are connected to Oars because of their straw hats. I believe the Oars from the Void Century was the owner of the giant straw hat and we know how important it is with Carrie and Will. For Blackbeard and Rox, they are connected to Oars with their Jolly Rogers. Notice how Blackbeard's Jolly Roger is the exact same thing as what both Oars and Oars Jr. wear. Just like the straw hat, this three skull symbol may be passed down from Joy Boy or the Oars raised from the Void Century since we see Oars wear it on her rope around his body and then Oars Jr. wear it as a necklace. Another way Blackbeard's Jolly Rogers connected with Oars has to do with the real Blackbeard. The real Blackbeard, also known as Edward Teach, had a Jolly Roger with the devil on it. In case you don't know, Oars is known as the devil of One Piece. I wonder if there's something more to the devil and Blackbeard. Now, Rox's Jolly Roger is connected to Oars because he literally has an Oni on it and another one as his ship's figurehead. I wonder how he also learned about the Oni race and even decided to make it his Jolly Roger. So now 
that you know all these connections, you may wonder, well, why do they matter? They matter because Joy Boy being directly tied to Rox, Roger, God Valley, and Shandora may prove that God Valley was a part of the Ancient Kingdom. I believe all of these connections also prove that Shandora and the City of Gold are connected because God Valley may even be the missing chunk out of the left eye of Jaya. Although I don't think Joy Boy was the king of the Ancient Kingdom, I still think he's the rope that links all men just like how Luffy is. At God Valley, there are probably signs of Joy Boy and the Void Century War just like there is of the Moon God's existence, but we'll get more into that with NL. Also, just like how Preach said in part 4, the massacre of the Lunarians may have initiated the beginning of the Void Century and of the ancient war that took place. Joy Boy always fights for his friends and the reason it may be a 100 year gap in history is because the previous Joy Boy could live for hundreds of years since he may have been an ancient giant. We know that the Elbaths can live up to 300 years and I'd expect the Onis to be able to live just as long, maybe even longer. You'd have to erase 100 years from history because that's how long Joy Boy lived or existed. Going back to how God Valley and Shindora are connected and possibly even parts of the same island, what if God Valley got its name from the people of the ancient kingdom or basically even before the celestial dragons. We know that people associated with the ancient kingdom call locations with godly names like when we see Skypea is called Godland. We also see other places called Heaven's Gate, Angel Island, and of course, the Holy Land. The Holy Land or Shandora as a whole seems to worship the sun god and even seems to have many relics that prove the existence of the sun god. We see that in Shandora all of their signs of god have Oni skulls on them. These are the same Oni or horn skulls that Kara uses throughout all of Wano to represent the beast pirates. This sign of god also has the logo of the sun with eight circles around it which we also see in Alabasta, Wano, and other places as well. We can assume that those countries are associated with the sun god and ultimately the ancient kingdom. We also see the Shandians wear masks that are literally oars. So yet again you can see the people that worship the sun god have oars connections. The biggest connection would be that they have oars statues laid out throughout all of Upper Yard or what once was Jaya. Even the Skypeans worship these statues but they call them birth or var statues instead of what they really are which are statues of the original sun god or oars. Shandora as a whole seems to be based off of the Mayan city of Teotihuacan. We even see exact drawings by Oda that depict the city when he draws things like Quetzalcoatl which is a god of the ancient Mayans. Now if all of Jaya and Upper Yard is based off of this then wouldn't that mean that Shandora is based off of the pyramid of the sun. The Shandians even do human sacrifices for the sun just like the Mayans. So now if the right eye of Jaya or Shandora is dedicated to the sun then shouldn't the left eye of Jaya be dedicated to the moon? If it is then wouldn't that explain that God Valley is the left eye of Jaya? As I explained before I believe that God Valley holds secrets of the Lunarians and even proves their existence. We learned that 800 years ago the Shandians had to fight off the celestial dragons and the current world government to keep their land. If they had to then wouldn't it make sense that the left eye of Jaya also had people defending their sacred temple and land. And just like how the world government took the red line from the Lunarians, what if they also took the Lunarian temples from the ancient kingdom? By the way, I don't think God Valley was the home to the Lunarians. I think it was just a place that was dedicated to the race. Kind of like how Shandora is dedicated to the sun god. I also don't think that the Ors race or Ors himself lived at Shandora or even Jaya. Another thing that connects God Valley and Shandora is that both of these temples symbolize immortality in a way. I already explained earlier how I believe the Emerald City will have the Emerald Tablet, but gold also symbolizes immortality. In alchemy, the Philosopher's Stone allows one to know and hold the secrets of immortality, allowing you to transmute lead into pure gold. Creating gold was the ultimate goal of the medieval alchemists and philosophers because once they could do that, they could also be immortal. We also know that at the One Piece, you find some sort of secret to immortality that no one else in the world knows because Roger's last words to his right hand man Ray Lee is, I'm not gonna die partner. It's interesting that he said this since he said it as a dying man who was about to turn himself in and get his head chopped. Roger himself seems to know that he's not gonna ever die since his will will be passed on. Dr. Hiraluk already told us that a man doesn't die until he's forgotten. So as you can see, there's a lot of immortality references in One Piece and one seems to be physically immortal which is Emu while the other seems to be based on will which is represented throughout the whole will of D clan. The ancient people knew about this and that could explain why Oda chose them to have a city of gold and a city of emeralds. Another thing 
thing is that yet again Roger, the same guy who represents gold and found the city of gold, is two sides of the same coin with rocks. Just like how Roger realized that he is immortal, rocks realized that he wanted to be immortal but in a different way. Rocks wanted to become immortal in the same way that Emu is. He wanted to physically be immortal with his physical body never being able to age. Roger realized that his physical body will die and decay but the immortal part of him will always live on. His spirit, soul, and will will live on to the future generations. Just like how when a philosopher learns the secrets to immortality, they can create gold. Goldie Roger learned the secrets to immortality, which is why he is symbolized by gold. The emerald tablets tell you the key to immortality, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you learn the secret. You can read the tablet, but not understand it, which is the case with most people. This is just like how Rox may have found the emerald tablet in One Piece, or at least symbolized it. He tried finding the secrets to becoming immortal, but didn't actually achieve it. So now that you understand why I believe God Valley is actually the left eye of Jaya, the moon temple, and lastly, the emerald city, now let's talk about what actually happened to the island itself, how it went missing from the world, and how we might already know what island it is, except of course, it now goes by a different name. So I believe that there are five ways God Valley could have gone missing. The first most obvious way is by a buster call. I find this unlikely though because there were celestial dragons there. The second way is by Fujitora's fruit. Fujitora's fruit can control gravity and an awakening of his could potentially pick a whole island up from the ground itself. If someone was at the God Valley incident with Fujitora's awakened fruit, they could have potentially picked up the island itself and sent it off somewhere in the sky or even in space where it could no longer be found. The third way God Valley could have been erased from history is from Kaido. We know that Kaido obtained his fruit the day of God Valley and if he got so angry after Rox's death, he may have lifted the island up as a whole while being in a trance state of anger. Again, he may have lifted it up all the way to the point where it would land somewhere in the sky, no longer to be found by anyone in the blue sea. I wonder if Kaido's first appearance in a sky island could be foreshadowing something with this. The last two possibilities have to do with Whitebeard. Whitebeard could have sent a tsunami over God Valley or could have destroyed the entire island with his awakening of the Gura Gura Nomi. We continuously see Sankoku say in Marine Ford that Whitebeard has the power to destroy the world and this would hit harder if he saw firsthand Whitebeard destroy the entire island of God Valley. The final way I think God Valley could have gone missing is if Whitebeard used his fruit awakening but instead of destroying the island itself, he created a knockup stream to shoot God Valley up into the sky. If he did this, I would think it probably was an accident and theoretically he could do this with his devil fruit if he shifted something underneath the island itself, either from an underneath volcano or under the water. I also don't think that whatever the world government did in chapter 1060 with Sabo happened at God Valley and here's why. First off, if they wanted God Valley to not be known to the public even before the Rocks Pirates ambushed it, then why didn't they just blow it up beforehand? The second thing that doesn't make any sense is why do they have buster calls if they had this weapon? We saw them use a buster call in the Ohara flashback and also at Ennis Lobby. If the Oharan archaeologists actually did find out the name of the ancient kingdom, then why wouldn't they just use this power? Since it's kind of a plot hole that they never used it before. Also, could Ennis Lobby possibly be the place where God Valley once stood? I know Uteron's Ennis Lobby theory makes a ton of sense, but if the world government once owned God Valley, then wouldn't it make sense if its location was somewhere within the Gates of Justice? Another location that God Valley could have been located back in the day is right in the middle of the triangle. I don't know why, but for some reason, from the moment I learned about the Gates of Justice while watching the anime, I instantly thought, what if there was an island in the middle? In One Piece, I feel like anything is possible, so you never know honestly. Anyways, let me know in the comments where you think God Valley could have been located and why. So going back to what happened to God Valley, I think any of the possibilities that I mentioned before could have happened, but I think the most likely ones are probably the ones that allowed the island to go up to the sky. First off, if God Valley is the Emerald City, then maybe Oda took the famous line as above, so below, which is from the Emerald Tablet to be literal in his story. Maybe God Valley is now above or in the sky, just as how it once existed down below on the blue sea. If God Valley is the left eye of Jaya, wouldn't it be great writing by Oda if they both ironically ended up being islands that mysteriously went missing from the face of the earth since they somehow went up to the sky. In fact, I believe there is an actual sky island in Skypea that is God Valley and that Oda even told us about in the Skypea arc. 
start. This island is now known as the hometown of NL, Burka. This theory takes a bit of explaining to do, but trust me, when I'm done telling you all the details, you will believe that God Valley is Burka just as much as I do. Trust me, there's a lot of evidence. So just like how I said I believe Shanks is from God Valley in the first part of this theory, I also believe NL is from God Valley and even lived there as he grew up in Skypea. The God Valley incident happened 38 years ago and both Shanks and NL are ironically exactly 39 years old. That would make them one year old during the time of the incident. I also believe that NL is an actual celestial dragon but doesn't even know that yet. Most people can point out that NL has the traits of a celestial dragon since he thinks that he's literally God. There can also be many parallels with him and another celestial dragon, Emu. Emu, just like NL, is a ruler of the Holy Land. Emu has five elders and NL has the chosen five from his battle royale. Joy Boy is the natural enemy of Emu and Luffy was the natural enemy of NL. Lastly, Emu wiped out a winged race just like how NL attempted to. We also now know that Emu destroyed an island with lightning or energy powers just like how NL was going to. If NL was an actual celestial dragon, then wouldn't that explain why he's one of the only people that lives in the sky that doesn't have wings? In fact, both Kami or Gods of Skypea don't have wings on their backs and they're the only two people that don't in the whole arc. The other man who was the Kami is Gonfall and he may also be a celestial dragon since he seems to depict one of the five elders and may even be his brother. We also see direct panels where Gonfall resembles the five elder and where he seems to bring up his past of being a celestial dragon. On top of this, Gonfall's design also seems to be based off of Don Quixote and of course Don Quixote in One Piece is one of the last names for a celestial dragon family. So if Gonfall is a celestial dragon, it may show that the other false god of Skypea was also a celestial dragon. I mean the title for these two is quite literally god. Something just doesn't make sense about NL being born in Skypea since he doesn't have wings. I don't know who his parents could be and it almost seems that he didn't have any growing up because he has no sympathy for humanity and he literally thinks he's a god. What if NL ate the lightning Logia devil fruit when he was a baby at God Valley before the God Valley incident? I mean we do know that there were devil fruits there since Kaido received his fruit from there. Also do you think there's a chance that Kaido's fruit was there because Vegapunk was working on it and created Momo's fruit on that island? I wonder if they were trying to recreate other devil fruits like NL's and possibly Law's. This is a mini theory but you never know since Kaido's mythical zone was found there. So let's say that baby NL already had the powers of lightning and when God Valley shot up to the sky, he was able to survive because he's lightning itself. Then what if when the Birkins found him, they worshipped him all the way back to when he was a baby since he was lightning. Maybe that's how he received his ultimate god complex. If the people that live in the sky didn't understand devil fruit abilities, then they really would think he's a god throughout his whole life. So now the main reason I believe NL is from God Valley, which actually became known as Burka, is because the only time we ever heard about Burka, it's described in the exact same way as God Valley. When we learn about Burka, the White Barrette tells us that a sky island far away in the southeastern sky disappeared without a trace six years ago because NL destroyed it. Doesn't this sound almost like the same description for another island? Sengoku tells us that there isn't any map featuring an island called God Valley. As a matter of fact, God Valley itself vanished without a trace. So as you can see, both islands are described as vanishing without a trace, which makes it seem as if they are in some way connected. Plus, wouldn't Burka be in God Valley itself explain literally every question that's tied with NL? First off, it explained why NL would want to bring down all of Skypea and his own hometown back to the ground. If he saw the ruins of God Valley and realized that it was just like Shandora and was from the Earth, then he probably wanted to put it back down to where it belongs in its natural location. We continuously see NL say things like, the foundation of this country in the sky is unnatural. Land is the place for land. Humans have a place for humans. And the Kami has a place for the Kami. Each has a place to which it must return. After this, we see him say that as God, he is only following the laws of nature and putting humans and the land back where it belongs. He legitimately believes that it's his duty as Kami to do what is natural on Earth. The next mystery it solves is that NL believes that Kami should actually live on the moon. Now, where did he get these beliefs? Well, he may have received them from his hometown. If Burka is God Valley, and if God Valley is the city sacred to the moon gods, he may have seen ancient relics from the void century depicting the moon and the Lunarians. As Wipeyear did say that the Lunarians were the previous gods before the celestial dragon's rulership,
ship. Eno may have learned about this at God Valley, just like how it seemed Whitebeard, Kaido, and Big Mom did. Remember, I don't find it a coincidence that the only people who know about the Lunarans' existence are former Rocks members. Eno probably learned that the gods of One Piece came from the moon, and since he believes that he's a god, he wants to go live up there, with them, or on God's throne. This would definitely explain his obsession with going to the moon, which was never explained in any backstory or any SBS. Oda probably didn't show us Eno's backstory in Skypiea because it would have spoiled literally everything about the Void Century and God Valley. I also believe that at God Valley there were Lunarian statues. We already know that the city that worships the sun god had ores or sun god statues, so why would the city dedicated to the moon gods also not have Lunarian statues? I feel like the statues may only be as simple as being Lunarian, but could also possibly even be Baphomet statues. King's Rays seems to be based off of the Baphomet and Fallen Angels since they have black wings. They also have fire abilities and we always see fire behind King's head, just like how the Baphomet has a torch on top of his head. So now the final reason that may prove that there were Baphomet statues and not just simple Lunarian statues is because of all the goat references with the Birkins. The Baphomet is also called the Goat of Mendes because of its goat head. In Skypiea, a lot of NL supporters have goat-like features with their horns, ears, and faces overall. I'm not quite sure how they receive these facial features, but it just seems like a very random and strange thing. It's never been explained if they physically added these features after they were born, or if they were born like that. If they did see a goat statue at the island, maybe that's a part of why they have these features. Maybe they tried to resemble the god statues, just like how the Shandians resemble the Oars race with Oars masks. Another possibility for there being a Lunarian with a goat head could be that since the Birkins and Lunarian seems to be close in genetics, maybe some of the Lunarians also had goat-like features just like the Birkins. If there were goat-headed statues of Lunarians at God Valley, then maybe that's why Oda made it, whereas Sengoku is explaining the God Valley incident, he is also petting his pet goat. Just like how I said, everyone who witnessed the God Valley incident seems to be some of the only people in the world who know about Lunarians. Well, maybe Sengoku was also at God Valley and later on got a pet goat to show what he believes in. I always found it very random that Sengoku had this pet and it just never really made much sense as to why. This goat also has a golden bell which could be a hint from Oda, yet again showing us that Shandora and God Valley are connected. The next connection with NL, the Birkins, God Valley, and Lunarians may be the very name of the island. The sky people seem to have called the island Burka, which may be called that after the city on the moon which is also named Burka. Yeah, that's right. In One Piece, there's two locations called Burka, one in the sky and one on the moon. Now, why would that be? Well, what if the reason there's two Burkas is because when the sky people found God Valley, they got it confused with the city that's on the moon since it was a place that had many moon references. Either this or they may have called it after the moon city to honor it. Also, by the way, I know I've been calling the race of NL's men Birkins, but did you know that that isn't even what the race of people is called? Apparently, they've never actually been called Birkins in the manga or by Oda, and the only reason people even call them that is because they're apparently from Burka. Even NL is thought to be a Birkin, but we can clearly see that he doesn't fit the description as anyone else in the sky. So if their race isn't called Birkins, like how the Skypeans are Skypeans and how the Shandians are Shandians, then that honestly puts up the question as to who they truly are. We do know that they are a bit different of a race from the other two previously mentioned, but we still don't know what their race is called. This most likely proves that their race isn't called Birkins, which would mean that the origin of their race isn't from the Sky Island called Burka, which may prove that the Sky Island Burka is a relatively new island. I mean, they say NL was born and raised there, but Oda himself never said that NL or his followers were part of a Birkin race. Hopefully, we find out what the true name of the race is, which may answer a few of the Sky People's mysteries. And by the way, I will still continue to call that race Birkins throughout the video, but just to clarify it so you don't get confused, I'm just referring to them as that because that's what most people call them. The next connection with God Valley and NL would have to also be with the sun god and the symbol of the sun. I believe NL also found evidence of sun god Nika in the ancient hieroglyphs or statues in God Valley. The main reason I believe he is depicting Nika is because he wears drums on his back. Yet again, there was never a single explanation as to why he has drums. What if the reason for this is because he saw hieroglyphic carvings of people playing drums to their god? Either that or maybe he saw the sun god itself playing drums or having something to do with the drums as the ancient men may have been trying to depict the drums of liberation 
mentioned in their writings. And no thinking that he is God may have been inspired by a god in the God Valley ruins. Even though I think God Valley is the place dedicated to the Lunarians, I can still see them having sun god references if whatever was at God Valley did in fact expose the gods. Plus, I also think there could be sun god references because even the burqa that is located on the moon has sun god references. When NL goes to burqa on the moon, he finds hieroglyphs that clearly show multiple signs of the ancient kingdom. There's one sun on the lower left that has eight rays going out of it, just like how all the people associated with the ancient kingdom have suns with eight circles around it. We also see people with wings, which proves yet again that the moon city has connections with people from the ancient kingdom. So if the real burqa has evidence of the sun, then maybe the false burqa or god valley also had evidence of the sun god. Another thing with NL that may show that everything he does is based off of what he saw at his hometown could be the ark that he created. Could the ark that he built to take him to his godly throne be based off of the Noah? Yet again, it may be that he saw the legend of the ark and thought that it was his duty as god to create his own. The final thing that doesn't make much sense with what NL seems to know about is the endless verse. He says that the people on the island where he was born believe that god lives on a place called endless verse. He describes this endless verse to be a place where the land stretches out further than the eye can see and as a place where there's limitless earth. We later see that NL believes this legendary island or location called endless verth is in fact the moon. Well, what if I told you that what the people from NL's home were referring to wasn't actually the moon but was actually the ancient kingdom? First off, how is the moon verth or earth in any way? The moon isn't a place where there's soil, plants, or anything of that sort. We know that verth is just the sky people's word for earth since Gonfall tells us that they worship verth since in the sky they can't give birth to plants. Greenery and soil are not things of the sky and that is why they are verth. So if verth is the soil that allows plants to grow, then how is the moon verth? My belief is that Eno got the moon mixed up with the ancient kingdom. Since he may have seen references to moon gods, he may have believed that the moon was their home or a place where God lives. I think the real place where the gods lived back in the day is the ancient kingdom. We know that the Lunarians did also live on top of the red line, but it wouldn't surprise me if they also lived in the ancient kingdom or if the king of the ancient kingdom lived there. The next reason I believe that the endless verth is the ancient kingdom is because it describes exactly what the ancient kingdom may have been. If a Lunarian was the king of the ancient kingdom, then it could have been the home to God or a God, just like how NL says it's God's home. Also, endless verth or a piece of land that extends further than the eye can see can only be one island that we know of. It could only be the island of the ancient kingdom because Professor Clover describes it to be an enormous or immense kingdom. The third reason I believe endless verth is the ancient kingdom and not the moon is because when NL describes it, Oda draws a green piece of land being illuminated by the sun. This makes me think that it's actually an island that was once on the blue sea. The sun's illumination could be symbolic for it being a place connected to the sun god. NL seems to know a lot more than we thought he knew and I can guarantee that his return will be key to the final saga of One Piece. Who knows how much more he's learned while at the moon too. I truly believe that Oda hasn't made it where he's returned yet because if he did then it may have spoiled many secrets like Lunarians. Anyways, let me know in the comments if you still think he's coming back and if you do then also when you think he's coming back. So now with everything that I've explained as to why I believe God Valley is the Emerald City which also was known as the Sky Island Burka. Now let me tell you what this has to do with Blackbeard. So in part 3 of this theory I explained how Blackbeard wants to become the king of the pirates to actually rule the world and that he will also attempt to kill Law to obtain immortality. I do believe that in some way he is the new rocks just like how Luffy is the new Roger and as explained before you've already seen some of the connections with the four of them and oars. Well going back to that since Luffy is carrying on Roger's will he went to and found Shandora just like Roger right? Well what if just like how that happened Blackbeard will find or has already gone to God Valley? What if before Burger was destroyed Blackbeard went to the island while it was still in the sky? It definitely seemed that Blackbeard knew about Sky Island since we see him be the only guy in Jaya that tells Luffy that it exists. He seems very confident in his take and what if the reason for this is because he's gone to one before? It also doesn't seem that he went to Skypea or to Upper Yard since Gonfall tells Robin about the only pirate he's seen up there since Luffy and it was Roger. If Blackbeard didn't go to Skypea, then one of the possible islands that he went to is Burka. Maybe this is where he even got the dream to be immortal or to be the ruler over the world. He may have learned something about 
Lunarians and Emu while being there which may have triggered his insane plan. Burka definitely could have been where he at least learned about the Lunarians existence because as we can see in the latest chapters, it seems that Blackbeard actually knows about the Lunarians race. He says, quote, white hair, brown skin, and black wings as his facial expression looks as if he can't believe his eyes. We also now know that Blackbeard was also at the Rockyport incident with Long Kobe. What if the reason Blackbeard was there was to take Lost Devil Fruit abilities and give it to one of his crew members? We don't exactly know anything that went down that day, so this is just pure speculation, but it definitely would make sense as to why Blackbeard was present in the same incident as Law. There's also a popular theory going around now that Blackbeard might be from Ohara. The theory goes that Oda said that if Blackbeard had a real job, he would be an archaeologist. We also know that he studies history in his free time. What other important history is there to study in One Piece besides ancient history? We also know that he believes in all legends of the world like the One Piece. His ultimate goal is to become Pirate King and he needs to be able to read the Poneglyphs to do that. As of right now, he doesn't seem to have any other archaeologist on his crew or any people with a third eye. So maybe he is on his way to finding the One Piece by reading the Poneglyphs himself. If he could read the Poneglyphs and if he is an archaeologist, then maybe he actually understood the point of God Valley and its Poneglyphs. If that's the case, then he could have learned a lot of the mysteries when he went to the island. Maybe he also learned something about the Oars race at his time in Burka, which may have led to the inspiration for his Jolly Roger, which is the Three Skulls. Wouldn't it just be so funny if all Blackbeard was listening to Bellamy say how the One Piece, the Emerald City, and the City of Gold are fake, he could be thinking in his head how this guy is just an idiot because he's seen one of them for himself. If he has seen God Valley, then maybe that's why he confidently tells Luffy that the One Piece definitely exists. Now, the last reason I think there's a big chance that Blackbeard went to Burka sometime throughout his life is because he shares similar beliefs to the people from Burka. One of Blackbeard's most famous quotes is, the age when pirates dream is ending, a man's dream never ends. Now, this is very similar to what the people from Burka believe since the Endless Firth is known to also be a dream world. Maybe Blackbeard gained some of his beliefs while at Burka, and he may have even learned about a dream world as well. Another interesting thing is that it seems that Mont Blanc Cricket heard the rumor of this dream world too. We see at the end of Skypea that Cricket and his monkey friends are gonna go seek another dream or adventure since the City of Gold was finally proven to be in the sky by Luffy. Later on in the cover page of chapter 643, we see that they are finally setting out for the next adventure seeking at Krara, the island of dreams. Now, as I said earlier, I believe that the Endless Firth is actually the ancient kingdom, and if that is true, then that would also mean that the ancient kingdom is the island of dreams. So, did Oda actually tell us the name of the ancient kingdom on this Cricket cover page? Could the ancient kingdom's name be Nakrara? Plus, we know that Cricket has a hobby of searching for legendary islands or locations since he spent his whole life searching for the city of gold. Just like like how Luffy ended up finding the City of Gold and proving its existence to Cricket. Maybe the same thing will happen when he finds the One Piece or the Ancient Kingdom. A possible foreshadow of Luffy being the one to find this Island of Dreams is that in the very cover chapter where we learn the name of this island's existence, one of the monkeys is literally wearing a straw hat just like Monkey D. Luffy. Subtle hints like this is what Oda does best and it'd be insane if this actually becomes true. Another thing with this Island of Dreams could be shown you that that yet again, God Valley and the City of Gold are two sides of the same coin. People that are connected to Burka believe in a dream world, just like how people that are connected to Shandora believe in an island of dreams. So anyways, now you see why I believe God Valley is the Emerald City, Island of Burka, the place dedicated to the Moon Gods, and the Missing Eye of Jaya. If you enjoyed anything I said out of this video, then please like it and comment anything you feel down below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel because I have some more insane theories on the way that are just like this one. I have insane ancient kingdom theories, laugh tale theories, and many more. Thanks for watching and please remember to have a great day.